Fire. What is it? Why? Well, because every firefighter must understand what fire is if they hope to deal with it, control it, and extinguish it, and more importantly, stay safe from it. As the infamous saying goes, you must know your enemy before you can deal with it. Every firefighter must be intimately versed in the science of fire. Fire is defined as the rapid self-sustaining oxidation process that causes energy to be released in the form of heat and light. Combustion is defined as the chemical process between fuel and oxygen with the evolution of light either as a glow or a flame and heat. And pyrolysis, our main topic for this video, is defined as the process of breaking down a solid fuel into gaseous components when heated. As you will see in a minute, it's these gaseous components that actually are what burning. So what happens when a material burns? Well, we're all intimately familiar with the infamous fire triangle that's been around forever. Fuel, oxygen, and heat. We combine these three rascals together, we've got fire. And as we are well versed in, we know that if we take any one of them away, the fire goes out. Back in the 70s, they realized there was a fourth part of this. The fire triangle turned into the fire tetrahedron. Fuel, oxygen, and temperature or heat, when combined, have a chemical reaction that produces these flammable vapors. And just like with the fire triangle, we take any one of the sides of the fire tetrahedron away, and the fire goes out. So we look at this neat little picture here. We have a log that's being heated. And if we were to say, well, what's going to happen? Everybody quickly answered, well, the log's going to catch fire. And that's probably true, but it's a little more complicated than that. What's really going on is this log is going to start being heated. When it gets hot enough, the wood in the log is going to start undergoing pyrolytic decomposition or pyrolysis. The result is twofold. The part we want to talk about in this picture is that flammable gases are produced. It's these flammable vapors or gases that are actually going to be what's burning. The other part of the pyrolytic decomposition as depicted in this picture is going to result in char. We see on the right the wood is untouched. We see on the left that it's charred as a result of the pyrolysis zone which is in the middle. So regular wood, when heated up and exposed to oxygen, undergoes pyrolytic decomposition, which produces two byproducts. One is char, and the other, and more importantly, is the flammable vapors. Once the flammable gas is mixed with air, or most importantly, oxygen, in the proper proportions, and an ignition source is present, you've got fire. We look at this neat picture of a forest fire, and we all know that forest fires are very dangerous and violent fires. Tremendous amounts of BTU heat energy are released. But let's look and try to analyze what's going on. Well, once the fire gets going, we say, well, how does the fire spread? Well, we just would normally say the fire spreads from tree to tree, but it's a little more complicated. What happens is the original fire radiates the heat to other trees. These trees start undergoing pyrolytic decomposition because they've been exposed to heat and because of the oxygen present. The result is going to be char and, more importantly, flammable vapors. It's these vapors that are what are technically burning. Now, if we look in this picture, why are the flames so much above the trees? When you say, geez, it's quote unquote the trees that are burning. Well, like we just talked about, not really true. It's the flammable vapors that are the result of pyrolytic decomposition. They rise up because they're hot, they're buoyant, they mix with enough oxygen, and when they get hot enough, get an ignition source, they catch fire. That's why the flames, these burning vapors, rise so much above the fire load, which is the trees on the ground. It's extremely important for every firefighter to understand this concept of what's actually burning. It's the vapors that are burning. Thus, we have to control the production of the vapors if we want to control the fire. Now, let's watch a neat little demo. We've got a glass test tube here. We have a handful of wood shavings that we just got by taking a regular piece of wood and a knife and cutting them off. And now we're going to put them inside this heat resistant test tube. So right off the bat, we've got two out of four sides of the fire tetrahedron. We have oxygen, which is in the air, and we have our fuel in the form of these wood shavings that we're putting inside the heat resistant test tube. OK, now let's go and add a third side. We're going to add heat. That's going to come in the form of this torch. But you're going to say, well, the flame from the torch can't reach the wood because the wood's inside that glass test tube. And it's, you're correct. But what's happening is the flame or the heat from the torch is heating up the glass on the test tube. 
The heat is then conducting through the glass to the wood inside, and now the wood, in conjunction with the oxygen, is undergoing pyrolytic decomposition. It produces flammable vapors, which we know better as smoke, and when we provide an ignition source, they catch fire. Then we blow the flame out, and we, they can reignite them because we still have some flammable vapors left. But it's not a real vigorous fire because the heat from down below is stopped or slowed down the pyrolytic decomposition. Once we reapply the heat, we see the wood continues to undergo pyrolytic decomposition. The vapors rise up, and we have fire up above. So why doesn't the flame travel down inside that test tube? Well, that's a great question, and the answer is real simple because we're missing one side of the fire tetrahedron inside there. There's no oxygen in there. The flammable vapors have displaced it. Now we look at this campfire. Everybody's built a campfire, and we're probably pretty good at doing it, but let's analyze what we do. We know that if we just took a bunch of big logs, put them in a pile, and lit a match to them, we'd never get them to catch fire in a million years. So what do we do? We put a bunch of kindling and tinder down low. Well, what are they? They're very small pieces of things that can easily be heated up. Newspaper, leaves, uh, dust, uh, small little twigs, cardboard, things that we can heat up very quickly with a small fire source such as a, a match or a candle. We can get them to heat up and then they can slowly heat up the area next to them. And finally, when they get hot enough and they're burning enough, then they release enough heat that they heat up the next piece of wood that's closer, maybe a little bit bigger, it undergoes pyrolytic decomposition, gives off the vapors, mixes with the oxygen, gets an ignition source, it catches fire. That gives off more heat, and the process continues and continues and continues to finally all the pieces of wood are burning. So that's what's going on. Now let's watch another video. This is made by the Federal Government's National Institute of Standards and Technology, and it's designed to show the dangers of Christmas tree fires. Well, we all are well versed in how fast a Christmas tree can burn. Well, why? Because there's a tremendous amount of surface area. So that when something catches fire on the bottom of it, it can heat up the area up above it. And because there's so much surface area but very little mass, it can undergo pyrolytic decomposition very quickly, give off the vapors, catches fire, and it goes up. And now what happens is this fire takes off quickly. All the heat accumulates at the ceiling, radiates down, and we see what looks like smoke coming off the floor. And it is smoke. But smoke is flammable vapors. We have enough flammable vapors, enough oxygen, enough heat, and presto, we've got flashover. One more video. Superheated smokes plus oxygen equals fire. So as we watch this little demo, watch everything that goes on there. The art of reading smoke. Now this is a test demo they did in the metal container. They have a bunch of Class A combustibles, and we look at the smoke that's coming out. Well, remember, smoke is flammable vapors. Enough of it comes out, it gets hot enough, has enough oxygen, and the smoke or the flammable vapors, they ignite. So, why do we normally use water to extinguish a Class A fire? Well, partly because it's usually readily available and cost-effective, but also, and more importantly, because water can absorb a tremendous amount of heat. Once the fire load is cooled down enough, Pyrolysis stops, and thus the production of flammable vapor stop, and you guessed it, the fire goes out. So in order to extinguish the fire, we must ultimately cool the fire load, that is, whatever is burning. That's pyrolysis.